Hello, everybody. Good morning. How many of you have heard about Oni? Show of hands. Wow, lots have heard. Cool. How many of you have used it or tried it out? Uh huh. Okay, good, good. Then you're in the right place because we're going to talk about Oni today. And to start the talk, I first want to review a little bit of uh, 2017 in review for the Oni project. Bring everyone up to speed, what's been happening, what have we been working on, and then we'll shift gears about a third of the way through and talk about securing the boot of Oni um, and secure boot. So a lot of things have happened in the last year or two. Actually, in the last year. I mean, you can read about how many machines per month are flowing in, but I really want to talk a little bit about some of those new developments where, uh, like, what's, what, have we, what have we accomplished here? So in, as far as the project goes, we have improved the documentation. And so why is that important? Well, everyone likes documentation. It's actually the, the backbone of any project. How do you figure out how, how do things work? How is it designed? Um, those sorts of things. And so improving the documentation, it's a, it's a big effort. It's not like writing software and it's not like uh, testing software, but it's very important. Another big thing that happened in 2017 is reducing the build times. So how many people in this room are hardware vendors? Or Oni, let's say Oni vendors. have actually built Oni and shipped it on a product. A few. Well, they're my number one customer at some level because, you know, it, for their flow to be quick and fast is, is important. And so reducing the build times. And so we've made significant changes in the build system of Oni to accommodate uh, quick turnarounds and also hardware vendors who support you know, 10, 15 platforms and they have to recompile Oni 10, 15 different times for different platforms, it gets to be painful. So we wanted to improve that. And so we spent quite a bit of time polishing that up. Um, another aspect was support for CPU modules. So a lot of these hardware vendors, what they do is they design a small CPU module, like a microserver that's in the, the Wedge 100, which also runs Oni. Um, it's a common CPU module. It has a CPU, some memory, a storage subsystem, and a connector, and it can be mated to a baseboard. And so then a hardware vendor can use that same CPU module on four or five different products. Well, legacy Oni, like a couple years ago, we required them to compile Oni specifically for each mating of that baseboard, which was kind of silly because from their perspective, they were just manufacturing this one CPU module. It would be much better if it ran uh, a common version of Oni that could go down to the baseboard and read the EEPROM and figure out what type of machine it was. instead. Of, so there's a little bit more happens dynamically on the fly for these common CPU module cases. And so that was required a bit of it you know, jacking things up and changing the underlying infrastructure of the build system a little bit uh, to accommodate that. And then again, that really helps out the hardware vendors. Uh, also last year, we moved our base kernel version forward to the 4.9 series of Linux. Uh, that's important for lots of reasons. Uh, support for new hardware, new temperature sensors, new Intel NICs, new PHY drivers, new CPU types. Uh, uh, and also, most recently, uh, that allows us to pick up the relevant uh, backported changes for Spectre and Meltdown, which you know everyone around Christmas and New Year's time was in a tizzy about. And you know that that's still an ongoing thing, by the way. So, but being on a 4.9 series and picking up the latest LTS patches is a big help there. Um, and last but not least, is we added hooks into the Oni boot process for ASIC vendors to plug in their SDKs. Um, and so what does that allow is uh, Oni can light up the front panel ports during the image discovery process. It's not just the Ethernet management console, which is where Oni primarily pulls images from. You can light up all the ports on the box, and you can do image discovery across all those ports and pull images through those ports. Um, it definitely requires the, an ASICS uh, SDK to be in place, um, and so we've added the hooks for that, which was uh, quite a big deal. 
Uh, moving ahead, we're going to show some pretty graphs about the vibrancy and vitality of the ONI project. And so this slide here shows uh, the git commits per year, starting back in 2013. And so generally, you know, things are good at, up and to the right, almost 500 commits last year. And my measurement time was from summit to summit, so roughly from February 2016 to February, or February 2017 to February 2018. So that's my, my year here. Uh, moving on, this is uh, contributors. The blue line are individual contributors, and the red line are uh, contributing organizations. Um, generally up and to the right, which is you know, showing some growth. And the fact that the blue line is larger than the red line is rather interesting because that shows that for some companies, more than one individual is contributing, which shows you know, ONI is really a thing, it's happening, and there are resources across multiple organizations dedicated to it. And then finally, here's a, a little picture of the number of machine definitions that are in the ONI repository today. Um, both cumulative and by year. So the blue line is cumulative over time, um, which is nearing 150. And then the red, or the blue, uh, excuse me, the green boxes down below shows per year. And so we had nearly 50 machines added this last year. In fact, I added two more this week after these slides were made. Um, and this does not take into account the fact of these CPU modules. Those only get counted as one, where actually those might spawn off five or seven products. So the number of actual machines supported by ONI is quite a bit higher than this, though it's hard to know for sure. All right, and then also a big thanks for all the contributing organizations. I mean, there's a lot of names up there. Um, logos wouldn't fit. Um, really, is a, it's a quite a vibrant community. Couldn't do it. It takes all of us together. There's a lot of folks who are offering suggestions, filing bugs, talking on the mailing list, uh, making pull requests to add new machine definitions. It's, uh, it's really quite good here. All right, so now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about securing the ONI boot process. And specifically, I'm talking about how does ONI, which is really a small operating system, how does it boot in a secure way? Uh, and that should be clear to everyone that that's an important goal to boot in a secure way. Uh, and we'll be using secure boot to load ONI in a secure way. So the fundamental concept, if you take away nothing else from today, it's the, the root of trust and the chain of trust. Uh, it's up here in abstract terms, but basically you have a core root component that contains a public key, which is which then loads and inspects the next component in the chain. The public key compiled into the root component is used to verify the signature on the next component. And then the next component also has a public key embedded in it. And then when it starts to run and execute, it goes and verifies the signature on the next component and so on through this chain, thereby perpetuating this chain of trust in the that started at the root. That is the, the core concept of uh, the secure boot technology. And then, so specifically, we're gonna focus in on securely booting ONI on an x86 architecture. Uh, similar arguments about the root of trust and the chain of trust apply to other CPU architectures. It's just, they just differ in the implementations and the CPU details. Um, so here we're gonna be using the UEFI, the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. Uh, that is where the root of trust begins. The firmware comes from the hardware vendor and it has a, a database of public keys inside that's referred to as the DB. And it also maintains a database of blacklisted keys which is called DBX. And so the blacklisted keys are used during the, install, uh, the inspection process to say, hey, if I see an object signed by one of these blacklisted keys, then definitely don't, don't continue execution of that. Um, ah, here's a good question. So we talked a little bit about who's used ONI. Who has booted or used secure boot on a Linux platform? UEFI secure boot on a Linux platform. A few, yes, so in the Linux world, there's a small component called shim, um, shim EFI. Uh, we 
have, for brevity reasons today, we won't go into great detail, but it's a thin EFI application that's signed by the private key of a trusted public entity. And that public, the corresponding public key is in the DB of UEFI. And the sole purpose of the shim is that it contains a public key of the vendor that is used to verify subsequent steps. And it's really a bit of a sidestepped end around to get Linux going on a secure boot system where Microsoft's keys are the public keys in the DB. And so typically for all practical purposes, Microsoft is the trusted entity who is signing the shim, but the shim vendor is an OS vendor like uh, Canonical or Red Hat or um, you know, the only vendor in this case. It's a very thin layer. And then of course, going along with shim, is the, uh, the mock manager, the machine owner key database. This is a supplementary database of public keys that the shim brings along that allows an end user to, in, to build their own kernels and sign their own kernels and boot their own kernels in a secure way. Uh, we won't go into great depth on the mock manager, but it is a way that for an end user who gets a secure boot system to not necessarily use the the kernels that their OS vendor provided that allows them to build their own kernels and kernel modules and continue to boot them in a secure way. So going back to our root of trust, so the root of trust here is going to be UEFI and it's DB <coughs> and the thing that it's going to first verify is a signature on the shim. And as I said before, shim is built and compiled by the OS vendor, in this case an ONI hardware vendor, and the public key inside is that ONI vendor only hardware vendor's uh, public key. But that blue signature was made by this trusted uh, third party's private key, which for all practical purposes is, is going to be Microsoft, is how this works in the Linux world. Because Microsoft's keys are distributed in almost every UEFI vendor's uh, database of keys. Uh, it's just uh, how it goes. Microsoft sells a lot of operating system instances, that's for sure. So cruising along, now, what does shim do? It has a public key inside of it. Well, the next thing we want to load is grub. How many people have heard of grub on Linux? Probably more than, than shim. Yes, grub's been around forever, but it also has a EFI implementation that's used on UEFI systems. And, but again, it's a similar chain of trust. Grub has been signed. Now this time, it's been signed by the person who compiled it, which is the, the ONI vendor. And that's the only vendor's public key inside of shim. So shim's job here is to verify grub. And it has a, a few different ways of doing that. It can look at the, the internal key that was compiled in. It can also call back into the UEFI runtime and use the database of keys and the DBX. And it can also consult the mock database to see if it's a good um, valid signature. And finally, Shim, all of this is happening in the context of, U, of the UEFI runtime. We're not running Linux yet. It's in this UEFI environment. Uh, UEFI has the ability to register what they call protocols. Anyone written a UEFI application ever? Poor guy. <laughs> a couple suckers out there. Yeah, it's fun. It's kind of it's kind of nutty. Um, but they have this concept of protocol, which I think everyone else would call an API. And uh, program instances can register new APIs that can become accessible to other, other software entities. And so that's what Shim does. It registers a, another interface that entities can call that goes through those same three checks, which will show up here in a second. So moving on, now it's Grub's turn. So Grub is running now, and it wants to load a Linux kernel, right? That's what Grub does most of the time. But now instead of it having a compiled in key, it's gonna use this interface that Shim registered previously. Again, Grub X64 EFI is a UEFI application. It's running in this EFI runtime and it has access to all the environment variables and protocols, and so Grub will now verify the signature on the Linux kernel using the same methods 
that Shim used to verify grub. All right, so then we put it all together. So this was the picture we had at the beginning that was sort of abstract, and now we've filled in the blanks there a little bit. You know, UEFI validates Shim, and Shim validates grub, and grub validates the signature on the Linux kernel. Uh, and this can be con continued further. The Linux kernel could then go on and validate signatures on kernel modules or even uh, user space applications and go even further than that. So that's great. That gets you up to the point where the OS is running with secure boot enabled. It's fantastic. So this required a lot of, um, the, the good news is that whole sequence we now have working in ONI for ONI to boot that way. Um, it's actually quite a lot of work and <laughs> took a long time. I had basically this same presentation last year where he said, this is what we want to do. And we did it, but it took, uh, you know, 12 months. It wasn't, it wasn't overnight. There's a lot of ins and outs, a lot of spec reading, a lot of, uh, getting one's head wrapped around all those different types of signatures and how those things work. And to get there, we had to modify the build system. Um, so we're now building Shim. Shim is a, the application itself comes from, or the source code comes from our good friends at Red Hat. It's on their GitHub repository. And so we're downloading, including Shim in our build system. Um, and then uh, along with having to build new software, we also have to now enable the signing of software now throughout the build process. Uh, a hardware vendor can provide their own keys and we can sign these binary objects. You know, and making sure that grub is signed is important and signing the Linux kernel is important because that's how we perpetuate this whole chain of trust and keep that going. Um, and then for testing, the ONI project contains a virtual machine implementation called the KVM and it was updated also as well. It works with QMU and then for the UEFI implementation, it uses something called OVMF, Open Virtual Machine Firmware. It's an implementation of UEFI that you can run on a virtual machine. And so we can test out this whole path of keys and simulated being a hardware vendor and the whole nine yards and could exercise the entire secure boot flow, which, was, uh, which is very important to, to get all that figured out. So now, that's great. So Oni's booted securely now, but, but now what? Um, so for the future, we want to verify, what is Oni's main job? It is to go off and locate a, an operating system installer, pull it in, and then execute that installer. Well, now we want to augment that with one, one additional step, and that's to verify the installer before executing it. And so basically, we're going to move to a model of where the OS installers will now need to be signed. So Oni will inspect the signatures using much the same mechanisms that Shim and Grub used, consult the same databases of keys, and check out how, verify that installer before you run it. All right? And specifically, you know, so what does this mean? So now uh, OS vendors will now need to sign their installers. The NOS vendors will also have their public certificates somewhere public so that end users can find them. An end user can say, yes, I trust this NOS vendor. I'm going to put their public key in the mock database and say, yep, I know, I, I like it. I trust these guys. And then ONI will then utilize, will verify the NOS signature on the installer because it's, it was in the mock database. And now that installer will run and install itself. Now the NOS installer, they still have their own problem. The, the OS vendor, they have their own problem of getting of maintaining secure boot for themselves. I mean, they'll still have to have their own shims and grubs and signed kernels and whatnot, or else that secure system won't launch their, their OSs. But um, ONI will help make sure that, that we never dropped that uh, chain of trust along the way. And that's, that's the end. Whew. Super fast. I think we're on time. About right on time. About right on time. Excellent. So, uh, any questions? Any questions about ONI or secure boot? Actually, the question is not about ONI itself. Uh, we, uh, we last yesterday there was an announcement on Linux boot, the new the Linux OSF, boot. the Open System Firmware. Yeah. 
Yes, that's very how, exciting. Yeah, how does that compare with Oni right now? Because they showed a implementation where they use Linux boot to boot a networking OS, and that also is it a complementing solution or it's? I think it's going to be complementary. Yes, I mean that just started in uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'm definitely excited to move away from UEFI as much as possible because that is very painful, uh, and uh, yeah, my fingers are burned from touching it. Um, and I think having, uh, or at least minimizing its attack surface and also moving to uh, either a TN, well, a, a core boot uh, open firmware would be great. And they also have the, what is it, the, the G root project. Yeah, I think that's cool too. I think there's, there's definitely room to be complimentary. Um, I can see what Oni, what people really like about Oni when I talk to end users is the image discovery mechanisms, that it was simple. It's like, oh, wow, it does HTTP. You know, my UEFI you know, didn't, only did TFTP. Oh, I can do uh, HTTP. I can, you know, SSH into it and see what's going wrong. And, you know, people really like the ease of use of the discovery mechanisms. And so there's probably a way to mate those things, at least the ideas, and see what happens. And for sure, it would be good for OCP to uh, standardize on all that stuff, for sure. Other questions? Yes. You said this is available now. Is this in GitHub now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. OK. So OCP has an umbrella GitHub project, and Oni is a sub-project under there. OK, I didn't see it. I just wasn't looking in the right place. But I'm sure if you just Google Oni, OCP, GitHub, it'll show up. I could have some pointers. Um, these, these slides are online or will be eventually, so don't, don't kill yourself trying to take pictures. But there are, for, for further reading, there's a more, of a more formal specification of all the stuff I just whizzed through here about how we're going to sign installers and whatnot, and definitely more links to, uh, to the GitHub. Okay. okay. Thank you, Kurt.